welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. So if you're a pet owner like me, there's a good chance that you would do just about anything to keep your furry family members around for as long as possible. And it turns out that what your pet needs to stay healthy and happy isn't so different from us humans. Because if there's one thing that's going to impact their potential for a long, healthy life, it's diet. In just a moment, I'll talk with Dana Osborne, who not only says dogs do best on some of the same healthy foods we eat, but they also thrive on a lectin-free diet. Oh my gosh. And Dana knows what she's talking about. Before healing her dog, she transformed her own health using the Plant Paradox program. Well, on today's episode, Dana will explain why most store-bought foods are making pets overweight, arthritic, and skin problems, what we should really be feeding our pets, and the easiest way to start incorporating the Plant Paradox program into your pet's diet today. Dana, I'm so excited to hear about your story, and thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Dr. Gundry. So you've come such a long way in terms of your health. Uh, can you share that journey and what what you were experiencing? Well, you know, I grew up in an Italian family. Um, my maiden name is Pellegrini. And the funny thing is my mom was actually Irish, but my father insisted that she make Italian food. And honestly, if you had the choice between Irish food or Italian food, which would you choose? Uh, I so, agree. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a lot of pasta for dinner with tomato sauce. Sometimes we'd have a side of, or, or we'd have like steak with a side of pasta, chicken with a side of pasta. We'd have pasta for lunch. I mean, it was just, um, we ate a lot of carbohydrates. And at that time, you know, I was young, so I could handle it. I ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I loved going to the movies and having a big bowl of popcorn. Um, but, you know, my health didn't, start to deteriorate at that point. I was actually asked to be, uh, to join a ballet company in New York and I was a professional ballerina for several years. Wow. They just, yeah, it was, um, a huge passion. I've only had a couple, uh, animals, uh, ballet and little bits of skiing in there. But anyway, so when I went to New York, I had to lose quite a bit of weight. Um, they took out all my carbs, sugar. Um, I couldn't eat popcorn anymore, things like that. And I lost the weight. I was dancing eight, honestly, sometimes 10 hours a day. And I was doing great. And it really wasn't until I moved to the Napa Valley that things started to change a little bit. I basically um, retired from dancing, still in my early 20s, mm -hmm. and started being like a regular person, eating three meals a day. So snacks in between. And, you know, I wasn't dancing. So I was walking and hiking and things like that. I was pretty much okay. I started gaining weight. I didn't like that, but I knew, well, you know, I'm not a professional ballerina anymore. Um, and then I took a job with Wine Magazine traveling all over the United States. Uh -oh. I had, wine <laughs> yeah, uh-oh, winemaker dinners, uh, you know, client lunches, um, lots of reception with tons of hors d'oeuvres. And then it was the airport food. And I had my first ulcer. Wow. That should have been a wake up call for me. Um, but you know, it wasn't, I just went along and then they discovered that I had a bunch of gallstones. And then from there, I ended up having my first bout of diverticulitis. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a really bad infection in your colon. Um, it can be very painful and they have to treat it with very intense antibiotics. Um, the choice for me was Cipro and Flagyl made me so sick. As a matter of fact, I kind of went off the flagell a lot because I just was, it made me sicker than the diverticulitis, to be honest with you. Um, and I lay in bed for days until the antibiotics kicked in. Do you think I thought about my diet back then? No. Nah. No. No, I didn't. So, you know, my mom had diverticulitis. It kind of ran in my family. I just figured, oh, well, you know what? I just, I guess, just have to live with this and move on. Um and then a couple years later, okay, so during this whole time, I was in and out of the hospital with diverticulitis. So I must have been on antibiotics for five years. I mean, Cipro was so strong that, you know, um, if that doesn't work, you know, what else is left, right? So I was, they were saying it was very dangerous for me at that point. Then they discovered a lump on my thyroid. And my doctor did, um, wanted to do a biopsy. It looked really suspicious for cancer. So they went ahead and removed the left side. 
And now I enter what I call, if my health wasn't bad enough, my complete year of hell. I was tired all the time. I would sleep eight, 10 hours a day. Um, I'd wake up feeling like I never even went to bed. I would, they were trying to get the hormone medication correct for me. Um, they finally did, you know, I was a single mom. I had horses, a dog, several cats, and actually a few rescue ducks. And I was just having a hard time keeping up on everything. Um, and then the worst day of my life happened. I went to the farmer's market. That part wasn't bad, but I bought all those wonderful heirloom tomatoes. You know, it's summer. They're so beautiful. And who doesn't want to sit down to a big salad of that? Well, I did. I probably ate three tomatoes. Now, I was already a sick person, but honestly, I'm pretty sure that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I remember feeling really sick. It was different than the diverticulitis. It was like a pounding in my stomach. And I told my son I was going to go to bed early. I woke up at 2 o'clock. I was vomiting. I screamed for him to take me to the hospital. I was in so much pain. And, you know, when I got there, to my fortunate, I mean, if there's anything to be fortunate about, it was the ER doc that was on call. He happened to be a gastroenterologist. Oh. And he took my, he wasn't supposed to be on shift that night. I mean, we had a lot of conversations about it after, but he took my hand and he said, you're going to be okay. Your colon is perforated. You're very, very sick. And we need to give you emergency surgery. And then I think I passed out mm -hmm. and I woke up the next morning. Um, I had tubes down my nose. I was cut from stem to stern. Um, they told me they also took out my gallbladder because it was infected with a lot of stones. And I think the thing that I didn't know if I was going to tell your audience this or not, but I think it's important to know that I had a lot of green fluid coming out of this stuff that was coming from my stomach out of my nose. And this wasn't just for like a couple of hours. This went on for two straight days. And it was the lowest point of my life. I thought, what have I done? I haven't been eating that bad. Why am I so toxic? And you're a young and, person, right? Yeah, I'm a young person. Yes. I mean, I mean that, when was that? I mean, how old were you? So, yeah, so I was in my 40s. Yeah, I mean, that's young. 40s. I mean, all this stuff had happened to me. How could I, what did I do to deserve this, right? You know, little did I know that I was killing all my good gut bugs as well as my bad. And my gut flora never had a chance to even grow back. I mean, I caught colds, I caught everything, you know, Dana was now a sick girl and I was so strong and healthy before. And I was thinking, if this is going into old age, no, thank you. I knew I had to figure something out. So, okay. So you're at the, you're in your, you know, your forties prime of life. Uh, probably half people are saying, well, this is what happens when you get old, right? Yeah. Especially in my family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay, so what'd you do? Well, you know, I started documenting all the food that I was eating. Um, one of the things that I did love growing up on was broccoli. Um, so I would eat raw broccoli. That wasn't going to work for me. And then I cooked the broccoli, and I would notice everything. If I cooked it really good, um, you know, almost to the point where it was mushy, which I think is funny because you talk about that in your book, um, Brussels sprouts. So my mom did a lot of really good things. So, you know, she lived to be, you know, close to 90. She was 89 when she passed away, but she always had this amazing Italian dressing. As a matter of fact, I might send you a bottle because um, it is really good and Gundry approved, I'm sure. And so I had a lot of olive oil and I love that dressing on my, um, and I kind of became a vegetarian at that point, but I would slowly add foods back in and document everything. And, you know, if something like nightshades, I couldn't eat it, I'd take it out. Pasta, I was gluten intolerant, I had to take it out. I mean, I miss sourdough toast so bad. I don't crave those foods today, but what was interesting is I got to understand my own health by really listening to my body. And I had never slowed down enough to really take that into account. And I knew food was going to be the thing that was going to change my, my health. So you actually, this is, I think this is important for our listeners to, to understand. You actually kind of took the time to say, now, so how did you know that you were gluten intolerant? Did somebody tell you? Or did you say, gee, every time I eat this with gluten? Well, you know, um, it was kind of coming on the scene. A lot of people were talking about being gluten intolerant. And I remember going to my parents' house, I'd always have pasta, and then I didn't feel good. 
Um, and then eventually I was tested for it. And sure enough, I mean, gluten is a lectin. I was, you know, even today, I have to be very, very careful with the foods that I eat, I think, just because I'm so sensitive to a lot of things. But yeah, I did. I mean, mushrooms were great. I loved onions. Thank God I could still have garlic. For a long time, I couldn't eat raw garlic. It had to be cooked. Today, I can eat raw garlic. Eggs were a no-no. Thank God avocados were okay. Um, there were just a lot of foods. I loved eggplant. I couldn't do it. The big one, okay, was spaghetti squash. You know, everybody would make that into like a pasta and you'd have it with tomato sauce. And I'd be like, darn, I can't even eat that. You know, I would be so sick. Um, so, you know, and and honestly, um, it, and it wasn't until your book did so many different things change. And I know we'll get into that, but um, some of them are kind of embarrassing, but I'm, I'm willing to share. Right. Well, so... You know, after all this happened to you, did any any of your physicians say, gee, maybe we ought to examine what's in your diet that caused all this? Yeah, that would have been great. <laughs> and I asked them a lot. Um, I remember the, you know, go on the brat diet for different things. Um, but no, actually, I had one doctor that said, stay away from nuts and seeds. And then I had another doctor who said, no, you should eat seeds. So I'm like, you know, what, what do I do? Um, so I actually had to go out on a journey of researching uh, on my own. I mean, they just didn't have, I think, the time to really go into that, you know, because 15 minutes and their next patient is waiting. Um, and, and I was gaining so much weight and I was so bloated and puffy. And I just thought, you know, if they could have seen me before, they would have really realized that something was terribly, terribly wrong with me. Um, but they never saw me when I was in my youth and I was dancing and, and doing all those things. I mean, I tried to exercise and I did go to the gym a lot and I was kind of a class rat. But um, I remember one of my girlfriends saying to me, boy, you go to the gym a lot and nothing ever seems to change. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty discouraging, you know. That, uh, that's what was happening to me. I was literally at the gym at 430 every morning for an hour. And, and then I run 30 miles a week. And I was, you know, I was a Clydesdale runner. Uh, you know, I was a big fat guy and it didn't make any sense. I mean, look, you know, I, I'm, I got muscles, but why, why, why are they encased in fat? Um, exactly. Why can't I get rid of the fat? Yeah. What is wrong with me? Yeah. yeah. So how did you come across the plant paradox? On Facebook. And, you know, I didn't hit the volume right away. I just kind of like read the words and then I kept getting sucked in, sucked in. Then I put the volume on. And then I immediately went and bought your book. And then I researched, watched a lot of different things that you had online. And then, of course, later your podcast came about. But, um, you know, I like to say I was the second person that bought your book. I don't know if that's actually true. But, you know, I knew what I was reading for the first time. It was like the curtains opened up. The light went on. And I knew exactly how could I not have known all this. Um Part of my diet had become lectin-free just because of the research that I did on my own. But now somebody was telling me what I could eat and what I couldn't eat. And boy, that just saved me a lot of time, a lot of guesswork. <laughs> so <laughs> so was, when you started adapting this, was it, a, was it a gradual process or did you, you dive in headlong, you know, I, I'm, I'm all the way in? So yes, I dove in head first, like I do with everything that I do. And um, I, I read the whole book first. I wanted to understand everything that was going on and not just go right to the diet part, right? And I remember taking a long weekend. Um, I think I called in sick that day, whatever. And I just went to the grocery store and I got all the different things that I liked that was on your diet that I would want to eat. And I already shopped at Whole Foods and a little bit at Trader Joe's. So that part was easy for me. And I came home and I made several different recipes. I, I couldn't believe how delicious the food was. I mean, I kind of create my own recipes now. But seeing, you know, you on Facebook, watching all your little videos that you have, you know, over Christmas and different things you could eat. I just thought to myself, I can do this. And I'm going to be a lot healthier for it. Very good. So what, what's the first thing you noticed when you started on the program? So I'd have to say the inflammation. My face wasn't as puffy. I, of course, I lost weight right away as well, which was so like, oh, my God, finally I'm losing weight. <laughs> like, um, 
I love this diet. And, you know, the most embarrassing thing was my bathroom habits. Um, there were times where I'd want to go for a hike or a long horseback ride or just out for a walk with my husband. And I was always afraid to get too far away from a bathroom. Can you imagine? So, you know, that the bathroom part, you know, and, and the bloating in my stomach, um, I think probably took about four months to six weeks and I felt completely different. And I've, I've, I've only got off the diet one other time and I realized, what are you doing? And, you know, as, as I started traveling internationally and, you know, eating at Michelin star restaurants, poor me. Um, work, 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 work. But, yeah, I know it was, it was in Japan, and I remember asking this one Michelin star chef, and I said, you know, why don't you guys ever use brown rice? And he said, what's brown rice? Of course. And he said, we would never eat that, you know, and, you know, and that's when I switched to white rice. But then, you know, when I got your program, I just cut that out completely. Yeah. No, but it's, it's really, you know, you bring up a very good point, and I, you know, I meet with chefs, uh, luckily, all over the world as well. And you, you look at what they've learned and, you know, four billion people use rice as their staple, but four billion people eat white rice, not brown rice. And they do that That's to right. get rid of the lectins. And the chefs that I meet with in Italy, it's, it's hilarious that they all, to a person, say you would never cook a whole tomato, you peel and de-seed it to make pasta sauce. Everybody knows that the peel and seeds are lethal. And he's, everybody knows that. You know, and I, I was actually with a chef last fall in, uh, in Tuscany. And I said, well, how, how come everybody knows that? He says, well, everybody knows that. I said, well, where'd you learn it from? He said, well, my mother, my mother taught me. And I, where'd you, she learned it from, my grandmother. Everybody knows that. Yeah, yeah, so true. So I thought I thought that was funny, and I wanted to make sure I told you that because to me that was hilarious. I still have people who stop me today. You know, I sell at the farmers market with my dog food, and they'll say, "Well, why don't you have brown rice in there?" And I'm just like, "Oh dear Lord, you know how do I?" It's it's I hard. It's hard. <laughs> no, it really it really is hard. Um, you know, I, t I talk about in in the book um, Deepak Chopra's representative in Japan, a wonderful young lady had crippling rheumatoid arthritis. And she was on an Ayurvedic diet with a lot of brown rice. And mm. she had two hips replaced. She was basically bedridden. And a friend actually gave her uh, the Plant Paradox book and said, look, you, you got nothing to lose. Why don't you try this? And right. uh, same sort of thing she did. Um, came off of all her rheumatoid arthritis medicines. She started walking, got out of bed. She, a couple of years ago, flew to the United States to meet me, um, you know, back, wow. vigorous young woman again. And all because she was eating healthy foods and we took all, yeah. we took all those healthy foods away from her. And you know, it's true. And I did have a lot of ache and, aches and pains. And one of the things that I went off immediately was ibuprofen. I remember my doctor saying I could take up to six a day yeah, you're totally fine taking six a day, but don't go past six. And I think that, um, you know, when I think about now what I was doing to my system, I mean, I'm sure it would have been an interesting case study for you back then, Dr. Country. You would have been like, wow. <laughs> and, and you had been given so many antibiotics. Uh, has the has the plant paradox uh, helped restore your gut balance? You know, it really has because I didn't even know I had a gut balance and that that was going on. Um, my gut flora didn't even have a chance to grow back, right? You know, two years after a big dose of antibiotics. So I needed the antibiotics because of what was going on. But had I been eating correctly, I would have never even had the diverticulitis, which, by the way, I haven't had a bout of diverticulitis ever since. And um, my colon is perfectly healthy. Um, my doctors are always amazed when they see me. And sometimes I just walk in and say, hey, I just wanted to say hello and let you know the diet that I'm following. And, you know, you should be telling your patients that too. I'm pretty outspoken about that, Dr. Gundry, <laughs> but I'm okay with that, well, you know? You. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, yeah. we're all out to help other people and, you know, it's uh, good for you. Yes, definitely. So uh, what's one piece of advice you could offer listeners for getting started on the Plant Paradox program? You know, 
I think that's such a great question because a lot of people might be interested in going out and buying your book. Those of you, those people who don't know of your research. And I would say, get the book, read it like I have. Um, and then also I have here this book. You can see all the, so this has a lot of really great quick and easy recipes. But first I think you need to realize why you're doing what you're doing because sometimes We'll abandon a, a reason and we'll just, you know, maybe start eat, eating factory farmed animals. Why not? It's convenient. It's cheaper, that kind of thing. But then you know why it is you're not eating that. And and then do what I do. Just take a highlighter, go through the yes, please list and get all the foods that you really like. Take a couple of examples of what you can cook for dinner, maybe a couple of lunches. Um, it's very easy to take this program to lunch with you. You know, at first it's it's a little bit difficult, you know, because you're not used to cooking this way. And then it just becomes easier and you can do it. That's all I want to tell people. You can do it. You can change your life. You can heal your gut. Very good. And uh, for those of you who are not watching this or listening on audio, she was holding up the Plant Paradox Quick and Easy, which is the paperback, which we did because it's quick and easy. And it really is. And there's a 30 day meal plan on there. Okay, now I want to switch over to your work with pets. Uh, some pets are near and dear to your heart, my heart, and probably most of our listeners. So tell me about your dog, Vegas. Was she struggling with health issues before you changed her diet, or did she change your diet? <laughs> oh, boy, I'll tell you. Well, we're here today because of my dog, Vegas, and, and you, Dr. Gundry, as you know. Um, it was really interesting for me, because I ended up spending more time thinking about her diet than my own, and it kind of th got me thinking, why am I not spending time on what it is that I'm eating? Um, it was our lucky day when we went to the animal shelter here in Napa, my son and I, and we brought home this cute little puppy, and she was really the love of our lives. I mean, we also had cats, so I'm not, I'm, I love cats just as much. And, you know, I put down kibble for her and canned food, and she didn't want anything to do with it. Um, I thought she was just nervous. It was her first time in our house, that kind of thing. But then I ended up going to the store buying, I don't know, 20 different types of kibble and, and canned food. She would take a little bite of it, then go lay down, look up at me and say, you expect me to eat that? Hmm. And I was thinking, uh, yes. Can you just please eat some food? Um, I remember my mom telling me, why don't you put some chicken bouillon in there and then throw some chicken pieces on top and maybe that will get her interested in her kibble. Well, it did. It worked. But guess what? She only dug out the chicken pieces and left the kibble. And that was sort of like an aha moment for me. I was tired of buying all the different conventional foods. And I just decided that whatever I was cooking for my son and myself, I would just make food for Vegas. But keep in mind, I was experimenting with different foods. And so she was eating things like broccoli and chicken and, um, you know, hamburgers, that kind of thing without the bun, obviously. And I did check with my veterinarian nutritionist just to make sure that, you know, I wasn't leaving out any vitamins and minerals. And fortunately, I wasn't. It was real food. And that's why my tag name is Real Food for Real Dogs. And um, so Vegas started thriving. I mean, she really was doing so well. Um, and I remember going to the, the dog uh, park, which I did with my dog all the time. And people would say, oh, my God, your dog is so energetic. Look at her coat. I mean, it's gorgeous. What's your shampoo that you're using? And I was like, I don't actually shampoo my dog at all. Maybe I should. But her coat is beautiful because of all the olive oil and coconut oil that I'm putting in her food. And somebody said, oh, you're spending so much money on you're just wasting it on your dog. You're spoiling her. But the best was just leave that kibble out. She'll get hungry enough to eat it. And I was thinking to myself, why would I ever do that to my dog? And from there on out, you know, this was something I was not going to be persuaded from making uh, dog food for her. Yeah. Well, that's a yeah. So you you that was a that became literally your lifelong passion for her. It it did actually yes. Uh, you know, it's funny because sometimes I take out a bunch of chicken or steak. I mean, um, you know, I spoiled her. Yes, I did. And she lived to be almost 15 years old um, without any arthritis run, yeah. or health issues. Yes. But my son would come home from school and be like, oh, I'm going to grab a piece of that steak. And I'd be like, no, you don't. That's that's the dog's food. We're just, you know. <laughs> so he always laughs at me about that. He ate pretty well, too. I promise you. Yeah. So um, 
Well, I'm, and we, we recently had to put our super old rescue dog down, George. Um, we, we inherited, I guess, George from a, a woman who uh, died of, of cancer and had no place for this dog to go. And he was a very old dog when we inherited him. Cataracts, really couldn't get around. And we changed his diet and he started running with our pack. And uh, mm. we, think, we think he was 19 when we put him down, actually just a few weeks ago. But uh, he, had a, he had a second you know, lease on life. Uh, uh, we, th we really thought he was only gonna, we were gonna caretake him for maybe a few months and literally lasted five years with us and su surprised us. I, I shouldn't have been surprised, uh, no. Actually, you'll like this story. Um, our our oldest dog is is Pearl, who's a huge female Labradoodle, 85 pounds, and she had a litter <laughs> mate by the name of Gary, who some of our good friends bought. And Gary and Pearl used to play constantly, and they chase each other around. As time went on, about so Pearl's now 13. Uh, at about 10 years of age, Gary could no longer chase Pearl. Uh, he hobbled up steps. Now mm. Gary is he's pretty much he, he really hard to walk. He's, he's pretty much at the, at the end of his life at, at age 13. Right. We have a, a puppy Labradoodle that now Pearl at age 13 chases around as if she was a puppy. And it's, it's striking to see, you know, Pearl's litter mate is, is pretty much at the end of life and moribund. And Pearl, now 13, is, is chasing the puppy around as if she's a puppy. Wow. So it, it really does talk to the power of food. Um, I mean, you can be sick like me and heal your, yourself. Um, dogs, I, I mean, I, I'll give an example in a moment about my cat and how we transferred his life. But the human body and the body of a cat or a dog is so remarkable. If you just give it a chance, it can heal. And it needs to heal with the inside out. And we're just becoming a lot more aware of what it is that we're feeding our animals. I think, you know, I don't think these people who work for these dog food companies that are producing kibble and canned food and that are bad people. I just don't think that they understand what's really happening when their animals eat that food. So, um, but it is amazing. Don't give up on your animal. If you've got an animal that um, is lethargic, has less energy than you'd like to see, or is getting arthritis, you can still turn that around 100%. Yeah, absolutely. So you're currently working on getting your very own lectin-free dog food company up and running, <laughs> Napa Dog. So, so did the inspiration for this come from Vegas or where did it come from? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, I used to look at other dogs because she would run circles around um, other dogs all the time. And these are dogs that she grew up with. And, you know, I live on the Napa River Trail as well. And my husband and I take walks all the time. As a matter of fact, he walks our cats often. But that's another story for another time. And I would stop somebody and say, oh, you're, look, can I pet your dog? Oh, it's an old guy, huh? And they're like, no, actually, he's just six years old. Wow. And I started realizing, you know, wow, that is that is really unfortunate, you know? And I really look at every dog that I see. Many of them are, are limping. Many of them are overweight. The obesity bet between cats and dogs in our country is huge. So, um, you know, it was that. It was feeding dogs food, but it was all I could think about. I mean, literally, it became my passion. I mean, I had a great job, but I would be, you know, overseas, you know, at a spectacular event, and I'm sitting in the back thinking about dog food. So, <laughs> I knew I knew how to come home, um, quit my job, and start making dog food. So, what what are what are some of the biggest issues with commercial dog foods? I mean, what's wrong with them? Well, you know, let's just pick out kibble, for instance. You know, we all know it's highly processed, and it's also very high in carbohydrates. A dog is an omnivore, but he's mostly a carnivore. So, really, having too many carbohydrates isn't good. If you think about a dog in the wild, which was a wolf, um, many, many thousands of years ago, um, they would kill their prey and then eat what's in the stomach, right? So they would have some of the berries and the grasses, and then they would eat the organ meats, and then they'd go for the meat. So we really have to look at that as something that, oh, that would be an appropriate thing to feed a dog, uh, species appropriate. 
Now today, and after World War II, when we needed convenience and we couldn't use cans for canned food, I mean, that came back later um, because they needed all of the tin for the war. It's been a long time since World War II and kibble has just stuck around and I'm really surprised it has because I think that we know better by now. So I'll give you a little story about kibble. Um, so first you're gonna have like grocery store kibble and then you'll have high-end kibble and then all the kibble in between. So we'll call the grocery store kibble, kibble A, right? They're gonna use things like rendered uh, protein, meat, you know, Use your imagination on that one. Um, they're going to have like meat byproducts, uh, meat meal. And some of these are brought in from other countries, not just the United States. And some could be brought in from China. And there's been a lot of recalls with that. Then you have your upper end um, kibble. We'll call that kibble B. Now, they're going to be grain free. But first, they're going to start with a protein, too. So they'll use factory farmed animals. And again, it may not be sourced from the United States. Unless it actually says on the bag, sourced from the United States and made in the United States, it's not. And you can believe them on that because what they don't put in is just as important as what they do put in on the bag. And then they're going to be adding things like um, on the lower end, like ground corn, ground gluten, uh, ground wheat, soybean flour. Does that sound good, Dr. Gundry? Yummy. <laughs> and then on the higher end, they're going to be adding things like pea protein, potato starch, garbanzo bean flour. I mean, we're trying to make a dough here because we need to make a dough so we can make a kibble. Now, don't forget about all those delicious fruits and vegetables, right? You know, you see them on the bag. They're gorgeous. Look at the cranberries and the blueberries. Um, not so fast. Those are all powdered. Many of them are lectin loaded uh, vegetables, but it's in a powder form, sometimes bought from third uh, parties. So really what's in it? We don't know. They put that in. But before they put it through the extruder, they're going to add a synthetic vitamins and minerals to shore up the food. So it can be, an, it's not ever going to be an appropriate food, but at least we're not going to be killing our animals. It's a slow death, don't get me wrong, but at least the vitamins and minerals are there. Then they add natural coloring, which it can be a dye on side A, which can be very, very dangerous and unhealthy for your pet. And then on the other side, they might use like um, beet juice to make that piece of kibble look like a yummy piece of meat. Um, I remember getting some kibble once my friend was putting it out for her cat and one of it was green and she goes, doesn't that look like a beautiful pea? And I'm thinking to myself, that is not a pea. Trust me. <laughs> it's just green dye. I mean, come on, we're smarter than that, right? Okay. So now we have a dough and now we're going to take that dough. We're going to put it through an extruder, which is going to make it very, very hot so we can cook all the good stuff that could possibly be left in that food. And of course, all the bad. And then it's going to be pushed out into a little shape that you know is kibble. But before it goes in the bag, they're going to spray it with some really weird animal fat and natural flavors. And so your dog and cat will be like, hmm, that doesn't smell too bad. Perhaps I'll take a bite of it. Um, it's not good for your animals. I don't care. I mean, look at it. Does it look like real food? And I think we all can agree that we should be feeding our animals, you know, just whole fresh foods. Yep. So how do the ingredients in your Napa dog compare to traditional kibble? Well, I based everything off of your book. Oh my God. So <laughs> I wanted to make a lectin free meal for animals. Now, you know, I have two skews. I have a chicken and cauliflower rice and a um, beef and vegetable harvest. And I wanted to let you know that it's really important to me that I don't use factory farmed animals. You know, I think if we actually knew what was injected to these animals, the hormones, the antibiotics, but also their horrible living conditions. Um, you know, Mahatma Gandhi had a saying, um, the greatest of a nation can be judged by the way its animals are treated. And I think that as humans, we're better than that. We need to be better than that. We need to really take a look at what we're doing to these animals that we're eating, that we're feeding our cats and dogs, and because we're eating what they ate, right? And there's a lot of really bad stuff. It's not a good life for these animals. And so I only use um, meat that I get from certified humane farms and also gap-rated farms, global animal protection. And yes, I do have a grass-fed, grass-finished um, meat, wow. beef in <laughs> my vegetable harvest and I use things like spinach and carrots and um, you know turmeric I use cod liver oil coconut oil um, sea salt 
with a little bit of iodine in it because dogs need that too and so do cats and and it's been really great food so so it sounds like uh, and you you sent some and we uh, can't wait to give the dogs but i could actually eat it right uh, yes, actually you can. And you know, my husband and I, when we're in our commercial kitchen and, and, um, our cooks are always laughing at us because we try every single batch <laughs> where it goes out. And I just, you know, cause I can taste and tell if the mixture is really right. I mean, we weigh and measure everything, but you can eat it. Um, and oftentimes we'll have it for lunch. Now you've got, you've got a new passion and that is a dog cookie. Speaking of eating it. And you, you mentioned yes. in the letter you sent that, you actually sample the batch. And, I, you know, w there's all these dog stores everywhere, and they bake natural cookies for dogs. And to me, no offense, uh, these things are poisonous to dogs, just as they are poisonous to humans. So right. I was really excited because we all want to give our dogs cookies. You know, dog wants a cookie. Yeah. So yes. tell me about the cookie. Well, you know, um, it was sort of a, a pivotal thing for me during COVID and also a lot of my clients want to give their dog a treat, right? So they said, you know, can you come up with a healthy treat? And I was really surprised when I started looking into making a dog cookie. First off, I wasn't interested in having some high carbohydrate diet for a dog. I mean, this is a treat, people. Don't do more than two or three, you know. Um, but I also wanted something that didn't have sugar in it. I mean, I couldn't believe how much sugar we're giving our dogs by treats, molasses, sugar. I mean, some just say uh, white sugar, you know, processed white sugar. And so I came up with a cassava flour, uh, coconut carrot cookie, and it's actually gluten-free and vegan. And my husband uh, thinks it pairs really well with a nice Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, but it's really for your dogs. So um, please save that for them. It's it's a fun cookie. It's a fun treat, and you can feel good to give it to them. Well, good for you. Yeah, we need uh, we need more people thinking about uh, the you know the stuff we bake for our dogs um, ought to be as good as you know what we do for us. You know, and I want to add a disclaimer, since we're talking about this based on the plant paradox. You know, animals in general, and dogs and cats specifically, do have different nutritional requirements than we do, particularly cats. Uh, oh, yeah. So this means that some of the foods that may be amazing to our health and are on my yes list, like extra dark chocolate uh, or garlic, may be really dumb to give to our dogs and or cats. No. So I think you're saying and I'm saying that, yeah, the lectin free part of the plant paradox program is absolutely perfect for dogs. But that doesn't mean that everything on the yes list ought to be fed to our dogs or cats. Right. Yeah, no, actually, we need to be really careful. Um, there's some really poisonous items that are on your list, yes list for dogs or cats. Um, you know, and that is like dark chocolate, onions, garlic, any kind of, um, you know, sweeteners, um, xylitol, those types of yeah. things. And anybody can DM me. They can actually find a list online. Um, but please make sure that you know exactly what those things are. They're very easily found just by Googling it. So um, be very careful not to give those things to your dog so for instance if you're you know cooking some kind of protein and you want to put onions in there please don't share that meat with your dogs because because onions are very very poisonous to your dog so be careful and you know all your readers and listeners are very very smart savvy people so i don't worry about that speaking of listeners i know you have cats i used to have cats and i love cats as well uh what about uh cats and a lectin free diet Absolutely. Well, first off, we need to really realize that cats are carnivores. Yep. So those cute little fluffy things, you know, and I have three of them. So I would know are, you know, they're hunters, they're meat eaters, and they really don't need any carbohydrates at all. And I know a lot of people are going to be shocked to hear that, but they just don't. They thrive really, really well. They haven't changed over the years. You know, dogs, we can, they can tolerate a little bit of carbohydrates, but cats, you know what, they can't. And I found out because I was feeding my cat Louie um, kibble. This was many, many years ago. And I remember bringing him to the vet and he said, look, your cat is obese 
And if he doesn't lose weight, you're going to have to start giving, you know, in, injections because he's on the road of diabetes. Um, you know, of course, I turned all that around and now we feed our cats a raw diet. But um, I, I couldn't imagine doing that. I mean, he was pushing 20 pounds. He's like maybe 12 pounds now. He looks like a kitten running around. We need to feed animals the appropriate diet that they were meant to eat and stop believing all the other sources that are coming in. I mean, eventually I think kibble's gonna go away because we're gonna realize and as consumers, we're gonna stop buying it and then they're gonna start making something different for us. It was the same way with like organic groceries, you know. Remember you wanna go buy or something organic never even thought about buying it organic and you would see a dimly lit part of the grocery store with maybe a hippie there buying some little old apple and you're like "Ooh, why would I ever buy that I'm gonna buy these beautiful gorgeous apples over here that are huge and shiny well we've come a long way right so you can go into any grocery store you're gonna find organic and I think eventually you're just and, and you already have seen a lot of fresh um, ingredients for dogs and cats coming out but, you know, buyer beware, because even with some of the raw diets, there's a lot of carbohydrates in there. Um, they're loaded with lectins. They are loaded with really bad oils. Um, and if you read the book, you'll know what those are. So um, definitely a raw diet is best. Some animals like foods cooked a little bit. That's OK, too. Um, and again, there's just a lot of choices out there. And I'm happy to help anybody navigate that. Hopefully someday, if I get funding, I'll be able to really scale and grow and have cat food too. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think we should make people aware that you are, this is a business you are starting and you would love to get some uh, <laughs> inflow of funds and uh, investment in your business. So anybody who's listening to this, and what a great cause. And I think... <laughs> We, the dogs and cats of the world will demand this, and good for you for, for doing this. Thank you, Dr. Gundry. So how, how do people find you? Well, they can go to my website, which has a lot of great information at www.napadog.com. That's easy. And I'm on Instagram at napa.dog. Somebody already owned Napa Dog, and I'm trying to get them to give it to me. But until then, I'm at napa.dog, and also on LinkedIn at Napa Dog. Okay, that's very easy. Okay, now as you know, at the end of my, my podcast, I take audience questions, but this time we're going to turn it around, and you're going to you're going to have questions for me. I understand. All right. I'm so excited. Okay. Okay. All right. The first one. You ready? Yep. Okay. I want to know is, do you would you say you stay in ketosis most of the time? Gee, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> Okay. And I think that's one of the biggest uh, mistakes that, mm -hmm. that people make. We, there's absolutely no evidence that our ancestors were continuously in ketosis. Uh, right. And there, as I joke in the energy paradox, do you really think that when we killed that buffalo, that we said, oh, I'm only going to have four ounces of that buffalo because if I have any more of that, I'll, I'll break my ketosis. Or if we, if we hit that hive of honey, uh, we'd say, oh, I, I really only should have a teaspoon because I'll break ketosis. Or the worst thing is if that apple tree we stumbled upon, oh, I'm only going to have a bite of apple because it'll break my ketosis. Well, of course not. Um, we as people will learn in the energy paradox, normally, if we're doing everything right, we should be cycling in and out of ketosis actually every 24 hours. And right. then there would be times when, in the past, we wouldn't find much to eat for days at a time. And one mm -hmm. of the reasons humans have taken over the planet, like locusts, is we have the ability to go extended periods of time without eating and be in ketosis. But that doesn't mean that that is the nutritional state that we should always be in. And mm -hmm. you'll, you'll see that in the upcoming energy paradox. So no, uh, you should yes. not always be in ketosis. Well, thank you for answering that question, which actually leads me into my next question to you, which feels so weird that I get to ask you questions, but I am dying for your new book to come out. I cannot wait. The Energy Paradox. 
Can you tell us one little sneak, you know, tip that we can take home today? So we, uh, the energy paradox really is we are overfed and underpowered. And the, mm -hmm. the reason we're underpowered, surprisingly, is because we are constantly eating paradoxically energy rich foods and mm -hmm. we have overwhelmed the ability of our energy producing organelles the mitochondria to actually efficiently produce energy with the incoming mass of traffic going into our mitochondria 16 hours a day and work by Dr. Sachin Panda out of Salk Institute in San Diego has shown that the average American is eating 16 hours a day on average. And people, yeah. you know, people shake their heads and say, no, nah, there's no way. But in fact, this is human research using apps on phones. And the average person is, is having some form of food during a 16 hour time period every day. It's overwhelming for your digestive tract, I can assure you. <laughs> exactly, and it overwhelms our mitochondria. So there's a little tip for the energy paradigm. Yay, thank you, uh, yeah. Uh, one last question for you, Dr. Gundry. What is your favorite recipe? And um, can I just add a little caveat onto that? Sure. Do you often drink a red wine? And does that um, get in the way of you, you know, fitting everything in with your with your diet and then all? No, I, you know, I, I literally uh, try to force myself to have a glass of red wine every day, um, and. Uh, I, you know, I've gone into the book why I do that. Uh, the caveat is if you don't drink, don't start. And the other, yeah. the other caveat is uh, if one glass of red wine is good for you, that doesn't mean two bottles of red wine is better for you. In fact, the, I understand you know, that. <laughs> I know you're in the Napa Valley and we have to promote red wine, and, which I'm happy to do. But... Uh, it follows a hormetic curve that I talk about in the book where in general, hormesis says that which doesn't kill me makes me stronger, but all hormetic foods like wine, red wine, follow a curve. None is not so good. Some is good, but more is really not so good. And I talk a lot about this in The Energy Paradox. We call it the Goldilocks effect. Just right, and we want to hit just okay. right. Uh, you know, I have so many favorite recipes, but I think the one that I like probably the best is egg roll in a bowl because mm -hmm. it's number one, incredibly easy to make. No matter how busy you are, you can put it together. It really delivers a lot of gut buddy supporting material and mm -hmm. it tastes good. So, um, yeah. and you can find it on YouTube on my, on my videos. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of like egg roll in a bowl. That was one of the most fun ones I think we ever did. All right. So it's been great fun to have you. And, you know, congratulations on turning your health and your dogs and cats' lives around. And really, if folks are, are listening in or watching uh, Napa Dog, let's get some investors <laughs> piling in there and get her, let's blow her up, okay? Love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Gundry. I so appreciate it. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming on the program and keep up the good work. And I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to go home and uh, have some of your dog food myself. I'm not going to share with my dogs. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Take care. Uh, thank you. Bye bye. It's time for the review of the week. Courtney Chapotel from YouTube watched the interview on breath with James Nestor and said, Thank you, Dr. Gundry. As a decades-long sufferer of recurrent sinusitis, I have found this podcast, as I find all of your podcasts, absolutely fascinating. I truly appreciate that you focus on the oral microbiome as well as the gut microbiome and overall health. Keep the great interviews coming, exclamation mark. Courtney, thanks so much for your kind words. You know, it's reviews like this that help us reach a bigger audience and support our mission to transform the lives of people all over the globe. 
And I really particularly enjoyed that interview, and I've just recently sent James Nestor a review of his book that uh, hopefully will be posted on the upcoming um, release of that book. I really think it's a really, it's important, at least to me, that we welcome all aspects of improving our body and our health. And there's areas that obviously I'm interested in nutrition, but that doesn't mean we should neglect the other key essential part of nutrition, and that is the air we breathe and the way we breathe that air. So uh, I'm glad that uh, hit a note with you, and I hope other people will uh, listen to that one as well. So that's it for today's episode, and we'll see you next week because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.